Joining us online is David Bonson. He's founder, managing partner, chief investment officer of the Bonson Group, a bi-coastal private wealth management firm. And he also writes a bunch of newsletters on the economy that are all worth the read. David, thanks so much for joining the show. Hey, good to be with you, Ben. So let's talk about the new GDP report. It suggests negative GDP growth in the first quarter of the year. Uh, the media are covering this as, you know, kind of a mask for good news. Really, really, things are pretty great. It's just that the GDP report is, is you know, not taking everything into account. So what, what do you make of the GDP report? And then we'll get to the sort of media coverage of it. Well, there's a couple anomalies. I mean, remember, 1.4% contraction is annualized. So it wasn't like that was in one quarter. It came down that much. But even then, it was supposed to be annualized up over 1%. So that's a pretty big delta. A big part of the impact is the trade deficit. Just that imports minus exports reading into the math of GDP had a huge imp uh, input. We're at the highest level of goods trade deficit in history. I don't happen to think that's particularly problematic for the economy, but it weighs on the way that they measure GDP. But the bigger issue to me was that the PCE, the personal consumption expenditures, it's basically an inflation reading. They have to kind of deflate the GDP numbers by this amount, and they underestimated what that impact was going to be. That's really kind of why this number ended up being negative. So let's talk about the the way that GDP typically is measured. You know, I think people use it as sort of an all-purpose number because it's easy. You say GDP and then you give a number. Um, but what does GDP actually measure and how much of it is government expenditure? Because you know, th this is an easy way to jog GDP growth is to basically have the government blow out money on spending on a variety of, of topics. That, that's right. And so ultimately, um, the GDP has one of its inputs as government expenditures. So if there's a, a real big blowout of expenditures that doesn't take away from something else in GDP, it can push the number higher. The problem is government expenditures always take away from something else in the economy, because by definition, it's extracting from the private sector, either through taxes or borrowing. And so you can get away with it for a quarter and maybe massage the numbers, but cosmetically that can't last because it ends up having an impact into other productive elements of the economy. The non-business, the non, excuse me, non-residential fixed investment, that's the fancy term for business investment. That's the area of GDP growth that has been lagging since the financial crisis. It was atrocious during all eight of the Obama years, and it got up pretty nicely for a couple of years during the Trump administration. That's the area that is sort of sustainable. Like when you see that component of GDP really growing, that's when you know you're getting the ground laid for future growth as well, because businesses are investing in ongoing projects and productive activity. That continues to be a very just sort of blah component in GDP. So let's talk about, you know, your thesis for a long time has been that the major threat to the American economy is not going to be inflation, it's going to be stagnation. Uh, and we're starting to see that, creep up pretty quickly here. We have inflation that obviously is very high. There's a lot of focus on inflation. It's likely to persist throughout the year because of supply chain issues and the, and the after effects of Fed policy. But the Fed is about to ramp up interest rates pretty dramatically. They'll probably bring inflation under control, you would imagine, because they have a lot more room to move here. I mean, they were at zero. It's not like the Paul Vorkle, we're going to get to 20% interest rates in order to tamp down inflation. My guess is we'll probably get to maybe six or 7% interest rates at the very highest in order to tamp down inflation. The, the real problem here is that stagnation, as you predicted, is on its way, and it's looking like that's going to be the future of the country for a while. Yes, and the only thing I would say is that I believe stagnation's been here, but it's now becoming more pronounced. If, if you have your kids, I assume, are brilliant. If they're capable of getting A's and they're just getting B's for a long time and then all of a sudden start getting C's, they were below potential already, but then they went really below potential. That's what's happening with our economy now. We should be a 4.0 A-level economy that we've been running at about a B-level. Now it's going to come down to a C-level. And that's this Japanification idea of functioning below your potential, your output potential. And that stagnation to me is clearly a byproduct of excessive indebtedness where productive elements of the economy are compressed by the government spending, which is then treated with more government spending, more monetary accommodation that then puts further downward pressure. It's a vicious cycle, but stagnation is real. And unfortunately, there's very few things that can be done to get out of it that are not themselves painful. So let's talk about what exactly could be done to get out of the problem here, because we have some really structural long-term, midterm, long-term problems. I mean, you talk about 
the fact that we now have this massive debt, eventually we're going to have to pay that back. We were told basically that modern monetary theory applied forever on out. And so that this debt would never matter. It could drag out $30 trillion of debt and, and nobody would ever care. And of course, we have all these unfunded liabilities that are not taken into account when we talk about $30 trillion in debt. So what kind of pain are we going to have to inflict on the American population? How will that pain be inflicted over the course of the next few years? The problem with answering the question is that people have been wrong in the way they've answered it for my entire adult life. I'm not a doomsdayer, and I don't know the point at which the kicking of the can down the road all of a sudden becomes more painful. It's shocking that we were able to go from 10 trillion to 30 trillion. The bond market didn't even wince, but we did. I do believe at some point that there will be primarily contracted economic growth will be the worst pain. And if that's all that ever happens, we're going to be lucky. Japan has had 30 years of no growth, but they haven't fallen into the ocean. They're not in a depression. It's just a sort of, you know, coasting along economy. That's unacceptable for the American experiment. But that could be like the best case scenario for us. What kind of pain could it be? Obviously, it could result in significantly higher interest rates, significantly uh, higher taxes, Uh, more regulation, more funny business from the Fed, more distortions, but no policymaker has a solution here. If I were king for a day, what would I do? Which would be painful, which would hurt. If I'm in a ditch, I would quit digging. I would quit living above my means. So stop spending more than we're bringing in, right-size government, and have a 10 to 20-year plan to reduce the debt. But when you say, obviously, someday that debt's going to have to be repaid, I wish that were true. I don't think they intend to ever pay it back. We're speaking with David Bonson. By the way, he's the author of a great book, There's No Free Lunch, 250 Economic Truths. I mean, that, that first truth right there, no free lunch, doesn't seem to apply to our government, which, which has been trying to dine out uh, for, for quite a while here. So, you know, let's do a little bit of investment advice, like on a broad general level here. So I'm, I'm getting this question a lot from folks. Where do they put their money right now? It looks like we're about to enter a recessionary period. Do you think we're going to go into an actual recession here? Yeah, we're certainly going to. The question is always timing, and so it's not particularly helpful. I would be more in the late 23, early 24 camp versus late 22. I think that unemployment is just too low to see us tip into a recession. By the way, one of the numbers in GDP today that was better than Q4 was consumption. So for all the talk of Omicron or even inflation eating away at Americans' desire to shop, nothing really ever seems to stop Americans' desire to shop. But I think that a recession is inevitable because of business cycles, and particularly in this case, they're going to extract enough credit out of the economy that will end up being a slowdown. But I would imagine that ends up being in late 23, early 24, which is even worse politically for the Democrats going into a presidential year. So if we do hit a recession, not in the next six months, but sometime over the next year and a half, how do people prepare for that? Uh, Right now, you know, the stock market is incredibly volatile. Uh, you know, my, my feeling is always when a recession happens, if you have the money, that's when your actual money is made. I mean, when, when, when the stock market tanks, that's a great time to buy. When the, when the stock market went down in March, April 2020, I immediately started doubling my investment in the stock market like every couple of weeks um, and made out like a bandit, at least up until the last couple of months or so. Uh, so what, what's your recommendation? I've been telling people, you know, there are solid assets that are just over time. You're not going to lose value in them. Index funds are going to be a good investment even during a recession. Uh, the the real estate is always going to be a good long term investment unless you you know buy in just the middle of nowhere. Uh, what are some of your recommendations? Yeah, the main thing we would have is selectivity, and so you're right that during recessions everything washes out, but generally it affects things differently. So I go back to the beginning of my career when dot com blew up. And people talk about the NASDAQ was down 70%. The NASDAQ right now is getting hit hard. But that year, the Dow was up. And right now, a lot of value stocks, energy stocks, and you know, I know I'm talking my own book, but dividend growth, which is sort of what we do at my firm, it's all up on the year. And so that's what I think you're going to see is more of a transition in leadership from very speculative to more stable, more boring, quite candidly. And those things tend to do better in recessions because recessions punish over-levered companies. And in the value and quality side of the equity market, you have a lot less leverage and that balance sheet strength and free cash flow is going to go a long ways. So I'd be looking at consumer staples, healthcare, high quality energy, things like that, I think are going to do quite well. And not just for the next six months or year, I think for the next decade.
So uh, let's talk about the political impacts on the Biden administration. They seem completely disconnected from reality at this point. I mean, they, they are promoting policies that make zero sense at all. At the same time, you've got Chuck Schumer out there talking about raising taxes to cut down on inflation. They're also talking about forgiving student loan debt, which is basically taking the wealthiest and highest income cohort of the American population and paying their bills for them. Uh, is all of this just sort of knee-jerk policymaking directed at pleasing particular political constituencies? It probably is, but it's not very smart politically either, because who is that constituency? Okay, this inflation is caused by supply side problems. And what could possibly be worse for the supply side of the economy than raising marginal tax rates and disincentivizing more supply? The one thing they need, by the way, they could solve a ton of the inflation problem by reducing marginal tax rates and getting a flood of output that would soak up a lot of the excess liquidity. I don't know if Schumer really means it, but that politicking is very ill-advised. Um, there's a sense if I weren't a lifetime movement conservative that I would feel bad for them because there is no message that they could really portray right now. And that's because of the extremists, the progressives, the things they could say that could maybe help with center left voters are things that would hurt them with progressives and coastal young people and, and all the wokey woke. They're in a very difficult position politically, but economically, there's no question that Biden has to portray some command of the economy and he has no command of it, doesn't even know the right things to say. If I were him, I would fire Ron Klain and I would fire uh, his chief economic advisors immediately if for no other reason than just um, cosmetically, it would look like he's finally taking some responsibility. That's David Bonds, and he's founder, managing partner, chief investment officer for the Bonson Group. His new book is There's No Free Lunch, 250 Economic Truths. David, thanks so much for the time and the insight. Thanks for having me, Ben.